Oh, it's great to see all of you here this morning. Uh, what an awesome praise time. Uh, I, I just want to say before we get started, you know, I've got to be absolutely the most blessed pastor anywhere in the world. Oh. In so many ways, but more than anything, uh, to get to be here with you guys. Uh, I've said it before and I'll say it again. I, I can't think of anywhere I'd rather be preaching this morning or any group I'd rather be preaching to uh, unless we're just in a bigger place as more people. Other than that, and we may have to do something about the bigger place. I don't know what we're going to do about that. Back a, a few months ago, Bill tried to buy the place next door uh, that's now cruising biker wear. He was just going to cut a hole in the wall and join the two places together, but it didn't turn out. But sure wish it had now. <laughs> it, is, it is good to be here with you. Thank you, Lord. Just so thankful for each one of you. We're going to continue our study this morning where we left off last <coughs> week in 1 Corinthians. We're going to be in chapter 1. We're just getting started with this book. And today we'll be looking at verses 18 through 21. So 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, we'll begin reading in just a moment. Let me give just a little bit of an introduction here to get us all on the same page. Uh, one of the things that we've seen already in this book is there were four divisions within the church in Corinth. And uh, that was of great concern to Paul. He was writing to deal with several things, but that was one of the first things that he sought to deal with that was a problem in that church. And uh, if you'll recall, one of the divisions uh, placed great emphasis on human wisdom and human knowledge and human intellect. And uh, Paul is going to deal with that today. And uh, in the verses we're going to look at, we're going to see him show us the difference between human wisdom and godly wisdom. And uh, there is a difference. Yes. And, uh, and, and God is happy when we operate in godly wisdom. Believe it or not, He's not happy when we operate in human wisdom and human uh, intellect. If we allow those things to creep in to our lives and, and, and cause us to move away from God's plan for us. So that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. So let's begin reading with verse 18. He says, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Now the word of the cross here is of course referring to the gospel, the gospel message concerning Christ uh, being crucified for our sins. And uh, he's saying here that the gospel message, when it is preached, it has two effects. And the first he talks about is that it is foolishness to those who are perishing. Or we can say it is folly to those who are on the way to destruction. And uh, this word in the original language uh, uh, that's perishing here is in the present tense. And what that's saying to us is that the ones who are perishing are on a... Uh, ongoing process, an ongoing process of perishing. And of course, the ones that are perishing are those who have rejected the gospel. They've rejected Jesus Christ and what He's done for us for salvation. And so they're, they're, they're perishing, but they're continuing to perish, as this word means uh, in the present tense, as they continue to refuse Christ and continue to not respond favorably uh, to what God has offered us uh, through faith in Jesus, forgiveness of sin, and what Jesus did for us on the cross. So that's the first group. It, it, it's foolishness to those who are perishing. Now, there's a second effect on another group, and it's those, he says, who are being saved. Now, this is referring to those who have accepted Jesus Christ and His offer of forgiveness. They have responded uh, positively to the Gospel message. Now what's interesting here is that this is also in the present tense in the original language. And so this is also an ongoing process in which the person continues to walk out their life with faith and obedience uh, to Jesus. So we see then that, that uh, the perishing are those who refuse the gospel. They refuse Christ. And it has two parts in their life. It is a beginning. And the beginning has a continuing then as they continue in that process. So the beginning would be 
when they first sin. Because we need to realize that uh, the Bible makes it very clear that uh, whenever any of us were old enough to know right from wrong, every one of us chose to do wrong. And that's sin. And that separates us from God. And so that's the beginning of a perishing in every person's life. Now, what's happening in the continuing with them is that they continue on a lifestyle of living in sin and refusing faith in Jesus Christ. And that's what he's saying here uh, as he uses this word perishing. Now, likewise, the ones who are being saved and in the present tense of it, it has a beginning and it has a continuing. The beginning, of course, is the moment in time that you recognized your sin, you were willing to turn from sin, and you placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That was the beginning of being saved. Now, it has a continuing process. And that continuing process is that the, the born again <coughs> Christian is now supposed to, as Paul says in another place, work out their salvation. Now, now get this clearly. Not work for salvation. We're going to talk about that some more in a minute. No one can work and earn salvation. It's a free gift. We have to receive it by faith. But once we've received it, the continuing process is to continue and that will be a walking of a life of faith and obedience to Jesus. Will we be walking in sinless perfection? Absolutely not. Not here on this earth. But we need to grow and mature and become more of what God wants us to be. We've talked a lot of times about uh, being obedient and, and living responsible Christian lives before God and some of the things that's involved in that. So that's what the continuing process is here. So, we realize from the tense of these words uh, in the original language and the way it's used here that uh, true salvation then is a one-time act in which a person turns from sin and places faith and trust in Jesus. And the Bible says that person is saved. Their sins have been forgiven. They're on their way to heaven. Their relationship with God that had been broken because of sin has been uh, uh, restored. But it has the other part that we just talked about, the continuing process in which we walk in obedience and faith uh, in Jesus Christ. And what we need to realize is simply this. The Scripture is very clear. There, there is no leeway in this in, in the Bible. It is simply this. Every mature human being, that is everyone that's old enough to be accountable for their actions, every mature human being on the face of the earth, according to the Word of God, falls into one of the two categories that is mentioned in this passage of Scripture. That's right. Either they are perishing because they have refused to accept Jesus Christ and His forgiveness of sin, or they're lost, okay? Or they're saved because they have received Jesus Christ and His forgiveness of sin. Now, the truth of Scripture is this. There's no other category. Every mature human being, no matter the color of their skin, the language they speak, the part of the world they've grown up in, no matter whatever else is going on in their life, every mature human being falls into one or the other of those categories. And we're going to talk about that some more in just a minute. But that's an astounding thing. Because a lot of people don't, don't really realize how, how specific the gospel message and the Bible is at that point. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father other than through me. That's right. And this is not, not me trying to be a narrow-minded Christian and put someone else's religion down or anything like that. I'm, I'm just simply trying to share what the Word says. Because this is the Word of God and, uh, and this is what the Word of God says. Now, uh, Paul goes on here and, uh, and he talks about the, the Word of the cross, the preaching of the Gospel. And he says it has power. Now, this is also very interesting. The gospel message is not something that is a good suggestion that we could follow and live a better life. 
That's not what it is. Uh, it's, it's not even something that just talks about the power of God. But listen to this. The gospel message of Jesus Christ itself is God's power. Hallelujah. Let me say that again. The, the true gospel message from the New Testament, when it's put forth in its New Testament purity and truth, it is the power of God. Because the Bible says it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. So this is a, this is a message for everyone. And, and to respond to it requires belief. It requires faith uh, and responding to faith uh, in Jesus, which is what the message is about. Now, so we see that it has this power. Now, look at verse 19. It says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Now here, Paul is quoting from the Old Testament in uh, Isaiah 29, 14. And he's simply using this quote to back up what he's saying here. Uh, he's been saying to them that the wisdom of man will get us nowhere with God. And so, he is, he is showing here then that God will destroy the wisdom of the wise. The human wisdom. Okay, We're not talking about the wisdom that God can give. But we're talking about man's intellect and wisdom. And then he says he will set aside. That's what he uh, means here uh, in this next part. He will set aside, or we could say he will bring to nothing. And most clearly in the translation here, it is he will bring to nothing the intelligence and the intellect of the wise. And what he's talking here about is it's not... It's not bad because someone has intelligence. It's not bad because someone has uh, intellect. That's not what we're talking about. It is the human wisdom and ideas that a person would have that would say, well, I got another plan. I, I, I can know just as well what God will require of me and what He will accept or not accept in my life as you, other people or as a Christian, or as someone else. And this is what he's talking about here. It's that, it's that human wisdom that works out another plan other than the plan that God has. That's what he's talking about. And, and, and there are a lot of people in the world today that are, that are uh, operating out of that. And the Scripture is simply saying here, God's going to destroy that. It, it won't stand before Him. Uh, the man's intellect and intelligence that says, I can do this and I can do it my way and I'll still be acceptable for God before God. God will destroy that. And, uh, and, and, and it's important for us to realize that. Now, look at verse 20. He says, where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Now, listen to this. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Again, it's not wisdom that God gives. It's not intellect that someone can have to build a bridge that stands up for a hundred years. We're not talking about that. We're talking about this, this, this mindset that says, I don't have to do it the way the Bible says. I've got another plan. And God will accept that plan just like He will accept someone else's plan. You see, I don't have a plan. I'm just following this plan. And, and so all I'm doing to you is bringing you this plan. Because I don't have one. Because mine would be worthless. And everybody else's is worthless. It, it's, it's this plan that, that, uh, that Jesus has brought forth here. And we're going to talk more about that in a minute. But just let that sort of sink in here. So, uh, he's going to destroy that. And he's going to reject then all of those who are coming to him with another plan. Out of their intellect, out of their human wisdom, out of their knowledge, they're simply saying, uh, hey, I can get there this way. And they're going for that. And that's what is being said here. He will stand against that and He will bring uh, destruction to that. 
Now, what he's really saying here is this. Uh, had, has not, the, not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? And that's what he's saying here, that he's made it foolish and he will make it foolish. Now look at verse 21. He says, For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. There's the faith again. Okay? Now, this is, this is a really uh, exciting uh, verse here. Uh, you know, as we were talking about all this other stuff, you know, that the God in the He puts down what is in the eyes of the world as the things that the world lifts up. You, you know, there, there are so many people that are looked up to in our world today by, by, by the world standards. There's so many people that are envied. Uh, that are so popular, that are so powerful in terms of their uh, involvement in people's lives and all. And, and the, our world lifts all of that up. And all of that is part of this human intellect and, and, uh, and human wisdom instead of godly wisdom. I mean, look at, look at the sports people that make millions of dollars to go play a football game. Look, look at the movie stars that, that are just, they have more money than they could ever even know how much they had. Look at the people that, that everybody knows their face. And so a lot of people look at these kind of people, rock stars or country music stars or, or whoever they might be, and they think, wow, if I could only be in their shoes. But what we've got to realize is this. If that person has not come to realize that their wisdom won't work and come and receive what God has said, this is the way to restore your relationship with me, that they are the most to be pitied. Why? Because they will be the ones that will be the hardest to come to Jesus. When you and I realize need, that moves us to God. When we think we've got the world by the tail on a downhill run, why do we need God? And so, when people have all the money that, that, that they could ever spend, when they have all the popularity, when they have all the, the women or men, or all the whatever that they want, it's hard for them to come to the place and say, I have a need. And the bottom line is, no one is coming to God unless they recognize a need for God in their life. And so one of the most blessed things that has ever happened to you and I is the fact that we've had some real deep ditches in our life. We've had some real deep potholes in our life. We've had some times when we realized, man, I have blown this thing wide open and I can't put it back together. We think that's the worst time in our life. But if that brings us to call out to God, then it turns out to be the best time in our life. That's right. And that's what God wants us to realize here. Is, you know, the, the, Jesus didn't come. He said He didn't come for those who were well. He came for the sick. And, and we need to realize that. He's still coming for the sick. He's still coming for the weak. He's still coming from the broken. Because those are the ones that realize the need. You know, the people that hung out with Jesus were not the religious leaders of His day. The religious leaders of Jesus' day were the ones that helped put Him on the cross along with, with the Romans. He hung out with the people that they said, what are you hanging out with these people for? But they were the people that knew they had need. And they were the people that could recognize that Jesus was the one that had the answer to their need. And the, and the religious people never got it. They never got it. They put Jesus on the cross. And, and, and I think that we need to really hear that for every one of us here today. We're here because we've had a need. And God says, that's good. 
I'm here to meet your need if you just let me do it. So it's a good deal here, okay? Now, let's go on with this. Uh, verse 21, let me read it again. It says, For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Now, I want to read this from another translation because it, it says the same thing, but it just puts the order of the words a little clearer. So listen to this from the, that same verse from the New Living uh, Translation. Now listen to this. It says, Since God in His wisdom saw to it that the world would never know Him through human wisdom. See, God knew that man would never come to Him by our own intellect and human wisdom, by our own knowledge. He knew that. So, because of that, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. <laughs> now, there's several things here. Listen to this. God was well pleased. He was pleased with His plan that would enable us as sinners to be restored in right relationship with Him. But it says even more to us than that. It says that it was out of God's freedom and it was out of God's sovereignty that He chose the plan that He chose. And this is what is extremely important here. God chose this plan and it's the only plan that will work and it's the right plan. Why? Because God is God. That's right. He has every right to choose the plan. He has every right to say, this is what it's going to take for you and I who've sinned and broken our relationship with God. He has every right to say, this is the plan. And if you will come to me by my plan, I sent my son to die for you. That's how serious I am about this. And if you will respond in faith to my plan, then you'll be forgiven, you'll have eternal life, you'll be restored into right relationship with me. It just goes on and on. But if, if, if we decide, you know, I don't like God's plan. I think God was wrong when He said that plan was the one that was right. I think I can do something different. You know, like, I think I'll be okay if I just become a member of the church. I think if I'll just get baptized, that'll take care of everything. I think if I'll just do the best that I can do, then God will accept me. If, if I try to take care of my family, God's going to let me in heaven. If I believe there's just some kind of God somewhere, God is going to accept me for that. Well, the Word says that that's not what's going to be acceptable. Because that is a man's plan. That's the human wisdom and knowledge. And so we see that God has the right. He's the sole one that has the right to choose what plan it's going to be for you and I as sinners to be restored into right relationship with Him. Now, notice this. He's, he's, he's not saying here that the act of preaching is foolishness. It sort of sounds that way, but that's not what he's saying. What I'm doing right now in terms of preaching, that's not what he's saying is foolish. But listen to this. The thing that he says is foolish is the content of the message I'm preaching. Now, why on earth would the Apostle Paul, by the leadership of the Holy Spirit, say that the gospel message was foolish? But that's exactly what he says here. It's the content of the message uh, that is foolish here. And so what we see then is that, that he's saying that the fact that God would have a plan that would send Jesus to die on a cross, that's foolishness to the intellect and to the mind and to the mind that says, you know, that's foolish. If Jesus couldn't save Himself, how is He going to save me? You see what I'm saying? The, the human mind has a whole different thought. The human mind says, oh no, there's a better way to do this. 
There, we don't have to believe in Jesus who shed His blood for us. I don't like to talk about blood. You know, there's all kinds of different reactions with people. I want to do for myself what I need to be made right with God. There are all these different kinds of, of, of ideas. But God is saying, no, it's a foolish message. But it's foolish to those who are not responding to it. But to those who are responding to it, it's life. It's freedom. It's liberty. It's salvation. It, it, it's blessing. It's everything that we can put into good words. And so we realize then that there's, there's the, the two different sides of this. Now, one of the things that's interesting here is simply this. Uh, Paul is talking here about salvation by faith. He said, of those who believe. Okay? We're talking about faith. Now it's interesting. When you look at Romans, Paul teaches all throughout the book of Romans that it is salvation by faith in Christ, not works. He's making it clear that nobody can work their way to a right relationship with God. Nobody can be religious enough or jump through enough religious hoops to be accepted by God. You must come as a sinner to respond to Him in faith. That Jesus died for me. And if I call out to Him and receive that gift, then His blood will cleanse me of my sins. My sin will have gone totally on Him on the cross. He was sinless, and He took my sin on the cross. That's what the Gospel is teaching here. And so, there's no way to work your way to salvation. A lot of people today are working their way to salvation. They're coming to church. That's a work. If you want to look at it that way. They're going out and trying to go door to door or house to house or they're, they're giving money or they're doing something to say in their human mind and intellect, this will put me in a good spot with God. No. It, if we're doing things in order to be saved, we'll never be saved. But the proper order is because we have been saved by faith as a free gift, then we go do things. That's the proper order. You see what I'm saying? And uh, that's important for us to realize. So Paul in Romans was saying salvation is by faith, not by works. All the way through that book. He just keeps hammering it. Why? Because there were people trying to work their way to heaven just like there is today. Okay, now what is he saying here? He's saying here in Corinthians, that salvation is by faith again, just like in Romans. But he's saying salvation is by faith, not by human wisdom. That's the difference that he's bringing out here. Salvation is by faith, but not by human intellect, not by human wisdom, not by what man says, if I do this or if I don't do that or I follow what this person says or, or follow what that other group says or believe this and I'm going to be right with God. And God says, no. I'm going to destroy all of that. It will get nowhere with me. I have a plan. Because I love you, I carried out the plan. And you can be made right with me if you respond to my plan. But anything other than responding to my plan because I'm God won't work. That's what he's saying here. So he's saying very clearly to this group that is in the Corinthian church that was placing so much importance on human wisdom and intellect and how they thought they could be do right with God and all. He's saying that that will work. And he's saying the same message to us today. He's saying the same message to the world. You know, some of you probably heard this, that, that a person can miss heaven and go to hell by 18 inches. You ever hear that? Okay. The difference between your head and your mind and your intellect and your heart that's supposed to be about 18 inches. That's what they're meaning. Okay? That, and there's a, there's a lot of truth in that. that. If we are coming to God by our human wisdom and intellect and reasoning and, and all of that, we're going to miss God. And if we miss God's plan, we miss heaven. But if we come from the heart 
responding in faith to God's plan, then heaven will be our eternal home. And that's what God wants for each one of us. But unfortunately, uh, not everyone is going to respond to that. Because so many people will be like we said a while ago. You know, I've done the best I can do. Uh, you know, I haven't done as bad as some other people. That's, that's a big one. A lot of people just judge themselves by other people. Say, I know somebody's a lot worse than me, so God let me in heaven. And you know, then there are some people that just believe that everybody, when they die, goes to heaven no matter what. Just everybody. <laughs> that's not true. It's those who have responded to the plan. So these are some important things for us to realize here and to understand uh, that, that it's God who has the authority to set the plan. It is God who had the love to give Jesus and to give a plan that costs so much. When you look at the agony of Jesus on the cross, then you begin to realize just a little bit about the, the, the cost that was, was paid so that you and I as sinners could be restored to right relationship with God. And you begin to realize that there's nothing we could do to earn that. All we can do is respond to God's love and receive it as a gift. So, we see here then that what he's wanting us to realize today is that that the gospel message, it was it's foolish to the world, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. So if you're here today and you've never, let me just do it, put it this way. I would like to just, if you could play along with me here for a minute, just just in your own mind, act like you and I are the only two in this room. Okay? And you and I are talking to each other. Everybody else just fade out of the picture, okay? Now, with that in mind, I want to ask you this question, and I want you to answer it in yourself in all honesty. Have you truly had a time in your life in which you recognized you were a sinner, in which you were ready to turn from that sin, and you called upon Jesus knowing that He died in your place for your sins and knowing that He's the only way that you can be forgiven. Have you had that moment in time experience with God? And this is just you and me talking one-on-one. -on -one. Answer that for yourself. If you have not, then you must understand you've got another plan going. There's something else in your head that is saying, if, if, if I do this, God will accept me. And what you have to understand today is, He won't. He won't. But He loves you so much, and He wants so much for you to come to Him by His plan so that He can give you every blessing that He wants to give you, not only now, but throughout all eternity. And so I would beg you today, Answer that question. Answer it truthfully for yourself. And if you have not come to that time to give your life to Christ in that way, I would beg you to do it today. Not one of us has a promise of tomorrow. Today is the day of salvation. Now I know some of you here, you, you say, well I have followed Jesus in, in, in faith like that. I know I'm saved and that, that's wonderful. But maybe you haven't followed Him as we saw the continuing process. Maybe you haven't even followed Him yet in baptism, water baptism. That's something He would want you to do. And I felt like this, this spring and summer, God has just really impressed me with the fact that all of you that come to church here that have been saved but have never been water baptized, that's our goal. That's God's goal, to get that done. Because that's an act of obedience to Jesus. Then there may be others of you who say, well, I've been saved. I've been water baptized, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to serve God in every way I can. Well, I would simply say to you, keep on. Hallelujah. And, and realize, realize that, that just as 
You were not good enough to get saved in the beginning. You're not good enough in your Christian life for God to hang on to you either. You understand what I'm saying? It's still by faith. It's still by grace. We mess up. It doesn't give us a license to just say, well, I'm going to mess up. It doesn't matter. I'll just go mess up intentionally. But we all mess up. But we need to keep in that close walk with God as those who are saved and realize that, that we need to walk in that heart of repentance and we need to walk in that life of faith and obedience. We need to use our time, our talents, our money, our spiritual gift to serve God, to serve others in His name. So there are things that because we've been saved as a free gift, that now that we've received it, we're to walk that out. So maybe you're here today and you say, well, I just don't feel like I'm walking it out too good. Well, God's not mad at you. God's just excited if you've realized, hey, I'm not walking it out too good. <laughs> and He's just there ready and willing to say, all I want to do is, is have you just let me live through your life. Quit trying to do it yourself. Let me do it. And I'll do it through you. It, it was mentioned earlier about the, 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 the burden. You, you quoted that verse of Scripture. That's what Jesus wants. I mean, we make it so hard and so difficult. And, and, and people will not even come to Christ sometimes because they say, I've seen too many hypocrites. I don't think I can live it out myself, so I'm not even going to get saved. You need to settle that. You won't live it out. You can't live it out. But once you get saved and the power of God is within you, He will then live it out through us. If we'll just let it. Our problem is, I gotta have a hold of the handlebars. Okay? That, that's our problem. Whether it's before getting saved or after getting saved. And what he's wanting us to do is just let go and let God. And that'll work. So I want to give you an opportunity to respond to invitation today. We have some ladies that will be right over here at this part of the, the church this morning when we dismiss, that would love to pray with you. If, if you want to give your life to Jesus, in a minute, go over and let them pray with you. Be sure that you tell them, this is what I've come to do. If you come in a recommitment in some manner to serve God more faithfully, then they'll be willing to pray for you about that if you want someone to pray with you. If you want to get on the list of sign up uh, for the baptismal service, You've already been saved. You want to be baptized now? Let me know. Another person let me know this morning. So we'll, we'll plug you into that. And uh, if you can't do it the 24th, we'll do it sometime in, in June. And if you can't do it in June, I mean in July. If you can't do it in June and July, we'll do it sometime in August. And uh, if you can't do it until it's freezing cold and it's about October, then we'll do it like we did for Kirsten last year. <laughs> what was it? September the 30th or something? Yeah. She said, I am going to be baptized before next spring. <laughs> so we went to the river. Wow. It was cold. <laughs> but anyway, we will, we will get that worked in, okay? Or if you're here today, you, you, you just need someone to pray with you. Maybe you have some relational issues. Maybe you have some physical issues, some financial issues, some spiritual, some emotional issues. Whatever it might be and you want someone to pray for you, ladies, come on over now. They're going to be over here on this side of the building. They're our prayer team, and they will be delighted to pray for you. So I want you to just, if you have a decision to make, you want prayer, just feel free right now to get up, come over here, and let them know what you want prayer for. Now, 